linking the wall to neuroeducation. How the neuroscience of sound, language and music shapes human communication. Nina Kraus, Northwestern University, Evanston. When the Berlin Wall came down, I felt encouraged. I felt hopeful. People can do the right thing. The grass is rustling. Making sense of sound is essential for survival. And it is computationally one of the hardest things that we ask our brains to do. Making sense of sound is also crucial for learning. Now, neuroeducation is using science to inform how we educate our children. In my lab, we investigate how our life in sound changes the brain. And we look at how different forms of enrichment, say you speak, a mu you speak another language or you play a musical instrument, or forms of deprivation, disorder, and decline, how that influences how your brain processes sound. Today, I'm going to focus on music and on poverty indexed by linguistic deprivation. So sound enters the ear, travels into the brain, and what is very important are the pathways that feed back and fine-tune our hearing system according to what we pay attention to, what we listen to in our lives. And so our hearing is, in is informed by how we think about sound and how we feel about it. The sounds of our lives change our brain. We have an evolutionary experiment with us uh, in a human life, and it is a process that is informed by learning continuously. So how do we access sound processing in the brain? Well, sounds can be very fast. Imagine uh, the difference between a B and a P happens in milliseconds. Um, the, 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 the pluck of a string, the crash of a drum, uh, the snap of a twig. And the brain responds as fast as the sounds itself. So we're talking about microsecond processing here. So how do we access this? <laughs> so we play sound into the ear, and then we record, using sensors on the head, we record the electricity that happens in response to sound. And what you can see here is that the sound wave and the brain wave actually physically resemble each other quite a lot. And you can take the sound, you can take the brain wave, and you can play it back through a speaker, and you can listen to how the brain hears. So, here's the sound wave. Da. 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 The brain wave. A few more examples. Da. 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 You'll hear a scale in the brain's response to the scale. Little Mozart. And my favorite. All right, so we have a lot to work with. And from a single response from the brain, we are able to look at how the brain processes essential ingredients in sound, and there are many of them. But they are rooted in pitch and timing and timbre. And what we are able to do now is to determine how good a job your brain is doing at processing these individual ingredients. And a mixing board is a really good analogy here. This is not a volume knob effect. It's not a matter of making everything louder or smaller. This is very, very fine tuning. And so an enriched brain might have a profile that looks like this and might be listening to this speech in the following way. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. All right. Um, a disordered brain might have a profile like this and would hear the same clip in the following way. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, 
Okay, so the wall that we have broken down is that what we're able to do now is that we really can access sound processing in the brain at a microsecond level of precision. How do we apply this knowledge? Well, one thing we can do is use this to predict reading ability. So we can play speech sounds, and we play them in background noise of people talking, and we can measure how an individual child processes essential ingredients of sound, and we can model them. And what we have discovered is that the way a child processes these ingredients tracks with their language ability at three years old, and you can take the same three-year-old and look at their responses at three, and it will predict their language ability a year later. Now, when we look at children who have actually begun to read, or they're reading, we see that how the brain processes these ingredients of sound tracks with actual reading ability. But what does this have to do with music? Language and music abilities coincide. We have studied the impact of musical experience on the nervous system across the lifespan, beginning with preschool kids, school-age kids, young adults, and older adults, and we have looked at this in educational settings, um, in adolescents and in elementary school kids. And these projects in schools came to be because the founders of these projects came to me and said, we already know that the children who are making music are better learners. What is going on in their brains? Well, music really requires that you make sense of sound and that you process all of these ingredients. For example, that, that every musician has to be able to hear the sound of his own instrument amidst this very complex landscape of sound. And so we reasoned that this ability to make sense of sound would transfer to other situations where it's important to figure out what is going on in a complex sound environment. For example, hearing your friend's voice in a noisy restaurant or hearing a teacher in a noisy classroom. And it turns out that we were right. Across the lifespan, we find that people who actively play music, and we're talking hobbyists here, not professional musicians, can hear speech sentences that are presented in noise. Tell me if you can hear the sentence. Anybody get it? How about this? Hear it? Sugar is very sweet. So, it, but beautifully, you can see it in the brain responses. So the responses of the musician and the non-musician to this sound, these are speech sounds, are, can be quite similar in quiet, but in noise, you can see that the musician's response remains robust in noise, whereas the non-musician response is really affected by the noise. So there's noise on the outside, but there's also noise inside the head. There is neural noise. And one of the things that I need to tell you about the children that we have studied in schools is that these children are all from low-income neighborhoods. And an index of poverty is, we know that linguistic deprivation often accompanies poverty, and it is measured typically by maternal education. And so what we did, well, we know that children whose mothers have less education are likely to hear about 30 million fewer words by the time they are five years old than kids whose moms have more education. So what we did is we took, these were all low-income children, and educated in the same classrooms, we divided them simply based on how much education their moms had, and we found that the kids whose moms had less education had more neural noise, and on top of it, they were not processing those essential ingredients of sound particularly well. So you can imagine the analogy of listening to the radio. They're static on the radio, and on top of it, the announcer's voice is kind of muffled. So this is difficult then, and we know now, we can see that there is a neural signature for poverty, and we have discovered that it can be at least partially offset by making music, 
as well as by speaking another language. So it takes time to change the brain. We saw no biological changes after one year of musical training in either of our Los Angeles and Chicago-based school cohorts. But after two and more years, we did see these fundamental changes in how the brain automatically processes sensory events. And the kids who were more actively engaged, we saw more robust changes. We found that the music boosts literacy and that these effects last. They last decades, actually, decades long after music education has stopped. And if you continue to play music regularly throughout your life, what we see is a biologically younger brain. So what walls have we broken down? Well, we have discovered a biological window into language and communication that is rooted in sound processing. And we know that deprivation, disorder, and decline can influence sound processing negatively. We also know that enrichment in the form of musical experience can enhance sound processing in the brain. And the wall that we have broken down is that now we really can measure sound processing in the brain in individual people with unprecedented precision. And we've also been able to move our research out of the laboratory and into educational environments. So making sense of sound really requires that our brains do the most computationally complex thing that, that our brains are able to do, which is processing information in microsecond time. And it is not surprising that so many disorders, for example, you get hit in the head, a psychiatric disorder, you have a language disorder, we simply get older. One of the first problems that we encounter is difficulty understanding sound in a complex environment. You can no longer hear your friend's voice in a noisy place. And so sound processing in the brain really is a measure of brain health. What walls are next? Well, we need to overcome the barriers. We receive daily oceans of correspondence from people from different fields who would like to use this biological insight into human communication. But we need to make uh, this, this technology user-friendly and cost-effective. And uh, to that end, I'm, I'm scientific officer of a company that is working to create a user-friendly platform so that we can make this ability to access sound processing in the brain globally accessible and empower scientists, clinicians, educators, and policymakers to really make this a standard of care. Because imagine, imagine if you could predict which children are going to have difficulty learning or reading long before they struggle to read in school, or if you can inform the learning and reading. There are so many reasons why a child can have difficulty reading. We can have insight into what the bottlenecks are. And we can use the biology to tailor intervention and to monitor outcomes, whether it be educationally, through device development, through computer technology. Um, and we can really use and improve communication by what the brain hears and listen to sounds all over the world. So um, I would like to acknowledge the people in my lab who do all the heavy lifting and are responsible for the work that I have shown you here. And I would like to invite you, please, to visit our website, which is a labor of love. And uh, we really try to make it accessible uh, to a very broad audience uh, that might want to intersect with our work. Thank you. Hey.